Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so, there we go. I was wondering if somebody was actually going to say it back. Uh, that's the greeting I got to use for four and a half months while I was in Dhaka this past spring. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my experience there and how I think we've heard a lot about being a global citizen and going abroad and that kind of stuff. I've done a number of them, so I hope this, this uh, anecdote gives you a little bit of an idea of how powerful those experiences can be. In my international travels, I've found that sports can be a pretty good seg segue in an introductory conversation. It seems to be able to bridge gaps uh, when you're meeting somebody from a different culture and you don't know what to say and that kind of stuff. Um, so I was a little caught off guard in January when I was introducing myself to two people I met on the trip and it backfired terribly. I was talking with two men from Afghanistan and we were ta chatting about healthcare. These two men were physicians and they were in Dhaka to get a master's in public health because largely as I believe, uh, they thought that medicine devoid of social context largely fails to provide solutions to health problems. So I used my go-to sports conversation for the trip. Cricket is huge in South Asia. So I wanted to bring it up, not only because I wanted to play and find somebody who would be willing to, to show me how to play, but just to kind of ease into that conversation, as I said. So I started off, and I was like, so do you all play cricket in Afghanistan? And if so, do you want to play together at some point? Now, I tend to think that I'm pretty well versed in what goes on in the world and have an idea of how that impacts people's lives. But what came next, uh, no amount of reading in papers or listening to pundits on talk shows or just hearing about these um, authorities on the war and that such ever prepared me for what I was going to hear back. Mirza, one of the two men I was talking to, um, just responded by saying, no, we don't really play cricket. In fact, we don't have much time to play sports. Our country is in the middle of a war. And now that may sound a little naive on my part. And I mean, in a sense, I guess you never really think of those things. So it's something that you learn when you interact out in the world. But his statement wasn't at all tied to my influence on American policy. They know how to dissociate between individuals and the, the policy of the government. But what it really showed me was that I just had a tremendous amount to learn throughout the world, or about the world. Um, I had spent, at that point, I've, over the last six years, I've gone through six different countries and a number of different experiences. But until you actually go out into the world, uh, experience these things firsthand, put your foot in your mouth, make mistakes, and learn to appreciate the similarities and differences around the world, you're never actually going to be able to truly understand what it means to be a global citizen. So, and I can tell you that because it wasn't until Dhaka was my sixth trip and I spent five months in Bangladesh. And while I was there, I actually, that was the first time I found out what I wanted to do in life. Uh, I went into college understanding that I wanted to get into global health, or I thought I did at least. Uh, and because you hear about all these trips, I'd done, as I said, this was my sixth. So I had been out done medical trips, done public health trips, done gender issues trips, et cetera. And I really thought that living in another country for a while would give me a better sense of whether I wanted to do that for a living. Uh, but it wasn't until I had time to reflect on what I did in DACA that I realized my passions lay more in domestic health policy and clinical care. For me, I'm inherently uncomfortable going to another culture without having lived there for several years and working to craft health policy because I don't believe my outside perspective could ever offer constructive criticism in a way that's going to be well received. Now that's not to say that nobody can. Personally, I didn't feel comfortable with it. And that was a tremendous uh, learning point for me. And I think uh, it's definitely something that everybody has the opportunity to see. As you saw in the GSI videos, it's a really powerful experience. But if you're not convinced by the personal development, uh, personal development opportunities alone, let me tell you a little bit about how it can impact your future careers. You no longer live in a world where you can interact solely with people from your own culture. I think you've heard that a lot. Bernard talked about it. We had a whole breakout session on being a global citizen. Your markets aren't going to be solely confined to the United States anymore. You're working with people from Beijing, New Delhi, Brasilia, Seoul, etc. So everybody knows the market's diverse. But what they also don't tell you is even in the United States, this market's already incredibly diverse. According to the 2010 census, in, there were 40, mil, yeah, 40 million foreign-born persons living in the United States. That number had increased from 31 million to 40 million over the 10-year span between the, the two decades, or the decade when they did the two census from 2000 to 2010. The United States is growing increasingly more diverse as time goes on. 
But that, uh, that figure didn't include their kids, many of whom are your peers, nor did it really include the regional differences between city-states and different geographic areas within the United States. You're going to be interacting with a very diverse market. You're going to have to be able to understand how to critically think, communicate, and collaborate, as Bernard said last night, with all of these individuals. But I think we've kind of beat that one into the ground as far as you're going to be working with a diverse market. So let me tell you about how it's actually impacted me professionally after all of my trips. I interned for the Department of Health and Human Services uh, up in Washington, DC. I study global health policy as a background, but my internship focuses on domestic policy, largely in part because I'm interested in domestic policy, as I said, but then also do because of the particular office that I work with in HHS, their regulatory capacity overseeing the $1 trillion that the federal government spends on healthcare annually. So do you know what they cared about during my interview process? They didn't care anything about my knowledge of domestic policy. They cared about my work abroad. They asked me about my studies looking at illness perception and health-seeking behavior of tuberculosis patients in urban slums throughout DACA. They asked me about my medical stuff in Haiti, and they even asked me about GSI. They weren't asking this because they were interested in it. They knew, based on GPA and what my experiences were as an undergrad, they could teach me what I needed to know in that office. They do look at GPA, but it's not the most important deciding factor. You should focus on it because it shows them your ability to learn, and that's what they care about. But they also care more importantly about the skill sets they can't teach on the job, the critical thinking, the working with diverse stakeholders who have different opinions. This is something they don't have time to teach you on the job. It's not that they don't want to, it's that the, this world just moves way too fast, except for if you're looking at Congress because that's going way too slow nowadays, and it's just getting ridiculous. But anyway, um, so the bad thing is, if you don't have these skill sets already developed when you go into an interview, they're going to pass you up. And it's not because they don't think you're a worthy candidate. In a sense, maybe you are, comparatively speaking, to the other people applying, but those people have taken the time to develop those skill sets outside of the classroom. You hear in a little bit about our educational system and how it fails to prepare you once you leave it. In particular, college is much more about just learning what the professor tells you and regurgitating that on an exam and you're, that's how you get your grade. You have to find out opportunities outside of the classroom to develop the skill sets you've heard about all week, or I guess it's a day at this point. Uh, but so what can you do as students right now? You have, this is the best time in your life to ever travel abroad. You have very few commitments as far as families and that, that stuff is concerned. I talk to a lot of people who are just young professionals at HHS, and they say one of the things they missed out on was not being able to travel abroad in college. Many, if not all of your universities at this point have sought to increase their global footprint. Uh, it's a very hot topic in higher education, global education, so take advantage of those opportunities. While you're here this weekend, I know there's a number of people who have traveled abroad, uh, so for those of you who have already traveled abroad, kudos to you. I hope you had a great experience as well. Uh, but this fraternity really embraces the role of global citizen, and I think we should all try and take advantage of that while we still can as undergrads. Uh, I'm not an undergrad, just a whatever. But, so, these opportunities have had a profound impact on my life, and that's the only reason I'm up here today. If DU hadn't challenged me to travel abroad six years ago at NC State, I wouldn't be here sharing my experience of DACA. I have a lot more anecdotes that have really challenged me to be a better individual, but it's also made me more marketable as a person on the employment market once I'm done uh, at George Washington. So, if nothing else, Go out there and try and experience the world for fun. Um, the one-week service trips that you've heard about, GSI, et cetera, are great, but I really encourage, if you have the time, to travel to a country for an extended period of time. Five to six months would be great. If you can spend a gap year somewhere, you should definitely do that. Uh, I think K-State, actually, they have a scholarship that I just learned about today that they actually require you to go to a non-comfortable country. So that means somewhere that doesn't speak English. If you can go to a culture that's completely different from your own, I was picked up, I don't, if you all aren't familiar with Bangladesh, it's right next to India. I don't look South Asian. I, the, <laughs> the number of times I was stopped on the side of the road um, because I was wearing traditional Muslim attire and the Punjabi and the pajama pants, sidebar pajama pants in South Asia don't mean actual pajamas, they mean pants. Uh, found that out in the store when I was like, told him I didn't need pants, but anyway. Um, the number of pictures, I, 
will exist in DACA, I'm convinced, for a long time because the number of political photos ask that I had to take with, because I'm in my Punjabi and they're, they're right there, is it was beyond any shadow of doubt well worth trying to travel to somewhere where you're not comfortable going. Uh, you'll look back on it and have plenty of stories, but a lot more of an idea of who you are as an individual. So I encourage you to travel abroad, and thank you for your time.